Hello? Hey, Marcus. How's it going? Hey, bro. Good. How you doing, man? Pretty good. I'm, uh, I'm actually at work. Uh, don't, don't take that the wrong way. Uh, I was going to say, you should be at work, right? Yeah, I hope yeah. so. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm working. Uh, what do you what up do you to? Do? I do security for a, uh, marijuana company, actually, uh, here in Vegas. That's a scary job, man. You know, I've heard of those things getting rushed and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I haven't had any problems so far, so. We'll, we'll stay a prayer for you. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Right. Uh, are you are you currently in Laughlin at the moment, or are you? No, we're going to be flying there tonight. We're going to go out there tonight. And you're normally in a Vegas show, and I know Laughlin is in Vegas, but we'd fly the day of, but because it's not Vegas and it's, you know, it's a couple hours away, uh, we're going to fly in the night before just to make sure. You know, this summer has been crazy in terms of travel, and we've been super delayed and waylaid and canceled. So we figured, you know what, we'll go into Vegas tonight. We'll make the drive out there, and uh, we'll be uh, good to go tomorrow. Sweet. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't even know actually about the the Laughlin show until two days ago, I believe. Uh, oh, well, that's yeah. good to hear. <laughs> uh, my my friends, uh, the they're in the Roxy Gun Project. Actually, they had sent a tweet out that they're playing, and I guess he responded to it and they shared it, and I was like, oh shit, Sugar Ray is playing in Laughlin. I should probably go to that, and. Uh, so I also own, you know, a, a web scene, and I sent an email out, and they responded within a couple hours yesterday, and I was like, okay, so making some progress here. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate the support and the help with that. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, obviously, if you're kind of a man with your, seems like your, your, you know, finger on the pulse, and if you don't know about this show, that kind of worries me a little bit. But uh, uh, you know, look, look, it's, it's, it's. It's Laughlin, you know, they got their way of doing things out there, so we're, you know, I'm sure we'll be fine. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll be out there tomorrow night for sure. Um, right on, man. Looks forward to saying hello. Most definitely. So, uh, let's talk about the early days of yeah. Sugar Ray. Uh, sure. What I want to know is the scene like what was the scene like back then uh you know the, the late 80s early 90s b b before you got signed you know yeah you know it's funny when we first started uh it's been 30 years this summer we've been a band together believe it or not it's crazy um in the late 80s you know it was all about hair metal here mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. all about hair metal and we were young we were a baby band we barely knew how to play didn't know how to write songs. We started off as a cover <laughs> band, you know, playing Judas Priest, Blondie, Run DMC, Sex Pistols, and, you know, everything, you name it. We had no sort of genre identification, and I, I think we still kind of don't. I mean, people do know us for the pop hits, but, you know, there's a heavier background, as we're mentioning right now. Absolutely. That we, still incorporate, that we still incorporate into the live set as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were really trying to be like, we wanted to be the next Faster Pussycat or L.A. Guns, except for we just weren't talented enough. So we kind of whittled away at our um, at our, our trade, if you will. And, and we played around locally in Southern California, and we got known for more of our live show than our technical prowess, let's say. I mean, it was always, it was always sort of an event where we were playing, you know, especially when we were playing down in San Diego where we got a little bit of traction down there. Um, you know, there always be hot girls down there and guys ready to fight and just everything that made a good rock and roll show Absolutely. happen. Uh, and so we had got a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a, uh, a following going in Southern California, but we were still playing a lot of cover songs and we were basically known as the party band to go to if you wanted to have a party. Yeah. Um, and then, and then the early nineties, after I graduated from college, you know, we started taking it a little more seriously. We started incorporating some of our own songs, um, but you know, our, our originals were, were joke songs. We had songs like, um, three piece and biscuit and, uh, you know, caboose and, and <laughs> gold digger, just stupid songs. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. we were just afraid to write anything that meant any, uh, meant anything. And we weren't very, you know, very good songwriters, but lo and behold, like the scene started shifting. Like when Nirvana came out, hair metal died overnight. That whole scene kind of died. And, you know, we were still obviously under the radar and, um, you know, bands started surfacing and coming out. Punk rock made a, another resurgence. So 
the technical prowess that was so important in the late 80s kind of went away in the early 90s. You know, you didn't have to rip a solo in a song. And, you know, if you could just put three chords together in a melody, you, you, you were kind of happening. And because if you had a Marshall stack and you, you could, you know, you had a Les Paul, uh, record labels were willing to sign anybody in the early 90s. I mean, it was truly... I mean, if you could just get up on stage, you were going to get looked at by a major label because Nirvana just broke down all barriers. Yeah. You know, they, no one knew what was coming next, but it, the label wanted to make sure they had it. So they were signing everybody. And we kind of got caught up in that wave in 94 and got signed to Atlantic Records. Um, and I'll, I'll just quickly uh, expedite this sort of before pre-fly. We, we, our first record came out in 95. And we, when we got signed in 94, we had two songs, two original songs. Um, and we lied to Atlantic Records, said we had 50, we've got a 10,000 person following, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. This is when you could lie to labels. There was no internet, there was no social media. Yeah. So we just, you know, we, we, uh, we fudged our bi- biography to say the least, a la Vanilla Ice <laughs> in the early 90s. And uh, we got ourselves a record deal. And there was sort of a careful what you asked for situation because we're like, oh my God, we just signed a two album record deal with Atlantic Records. Our dream just came true. We got to make a record right now. We have no identity as a band. We don't know what we're doing. We can barely write a song. And, and so we just kind of had to learn, trial by fire, if you will. Um, and so we went to the studio. We made our first record, Lemonade and Brownies, that were, was like kids in a candy store. I mean, literally, there's some of the softest, most R&B joke tracks we ever wrote on that record. And there's some of the hardest stuff we ever wrote on that record as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we found ourselves releasing the harder stuff, like a song called Mean Machine and uh, 10 Seconds Down and a song called Iron Mike. And uh, we were touring with bands like Korn, Deftones, Monster Magnet. We opened for the Sex Pistols in Europe, and we were gaining a little bit of traction, especially in Europe, And because uh, rap metal was kind of happening back there. Rage Against the Machine blew the doors open for all that whole genre, even though they're ironically not associated with that genre because they're so amazing. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we got a little bit of just, you know, a little bit of vibe happening, and there was something there. And we, we, we had the genius idea to cover a Howard Stern uh, song that he wrote in seventh grade called Psychedelic B. And we just did a punked out, thrashed out version of it. And uh, by divine intervention, he loved the song. And towards the end of that record cycle, Lemonade and Brownies in 95, he had us on his show. So literally on the last week or two of that record even being promoted by the label, we got the biggest numbers uh, being sold on that record. So long story short, not really, um, he, uh, uh, the label said, you know what, you've got a little bit of traction in Europe, something's happening here in the States, this Howard Stern national publicity has been great, we'll let you guys make a second record. Yeah. Well, Sublime had broke at that time, and mm-hmm. they're, they kind of came from our area, Long Beach and Newport Beach and uh, that whole Southern California vibe, and not to compare us to Sublime, but, you know, the, the legend has kind of grown bigger than, you know, what the band actually was. I mean, some of the live shows were, were, were not the best, you know what I mean? Because they were just so wasted or they were just on their own trip. <laughs> and so we erroneously thought somehow that if Sublime could do it, we could do it. Uh, and so we got a hold of their producer and we had a couple songs bubbling over. And by the fact that we toured the world uh, with Lemonade and Brownies, we got better as songwriters and better as musicians. And we stumbled upon the song that we wrote called Fly, and the rest is history. And the reason why I'm talking to you right now, Mark, is sure. so. That might be a way to answer that question in the most roundabout way, but I think you probably got more than you asked for on that. No, it's okay. Um, I, I like kind of going through the history of everything. And to, to let you know, I am a long-time fan of Sugar Ray, so... Um, well, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. So you, then obviously, you have an interest in that, that period. And, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, our first, our first national tour was with Korn. We opened direct support for Korn in 1995 for three weeks. And that first record of theirs and our first record. So there's definitely a history. I mean, I, I love metal. I love rock and roll. I, I love it all. I mean, I'm yeah. a three-time rock and roll Jeffrey champion for a reason. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm a fan first before I'm a musician, and you know, I'm in another band right now called Royal Machines with Dave Navarro, one of my favorite guitar players of all time, yeah. and Josh Freeze on drums, Billy Morrison from the Billy Idol band, Chris Cheney, one of the best players in the world, and what we do is we get, you know, because of Dave Navarro and these guys have such great access to all these musicians, it's truly an all-star rock and roll band, so I mean, I've jammed on stage with Ozzy, Sting, Billy Gibbons, Billy Idol, um, 
you know, Billy Corgan, <laughs> every bill you could think of. And uh, it, it's been a real joy to sort of, you know, get the rock on the Royal Machines. But, you know, like I said, we still integrate some of those old Sugar A, uh, you know, a little more hardcore songs into our set as well. And it's funny when you see the people that just know the radio songs kind of do the Beavis and Butthead face when they see us play Mean Machine or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. I, I've, I've had to show, uh, especially the first two albums, I've had to show some people some of those songs and they're like, that's not Sugar Ray. And I'm like, yeah, it actually is. Like, that's, that's the real Sugar Ray. Like, <laughs> well, you know, it's funny when you say the real Sugar Ray. I mean, it's what, it's what, you know, it, it, I feel like that is us. You know what I mean? I mean, we stumbled upon these songs. And listen, I loved the Beach Boys and the Beatles when I was 12 and 13. Yeah. We weren't talented enough to do harmonies. We weren't talented enough to, to write songs that sort of had meaning. And we also were afraid to. You know, we were young. We were beer drinking guys. And we sure. were just not guys that were sharing our emotions on our sleeve. And, you know, we got to a point where we're like, wait a minute, you know, we kind of had came up with a fly, and we're like, this is kind of good. Maybe we can write things that mean something to people. Yeah, Beer yeah. and cars are great, but what about, you know, maybe touching? So we were getting older and stuff, and so we stumbled upon these songs, and, uh, you know, we've been, no, we, you know, primarily in the public eye, we're known for these, these giant hits, which I am so honored and happy to have. But we will always dip into our metal bag, and, you know, we'll, we'll play some Judas Priest on stage and stuff every now and then to mess with people, because, like you said, it's in our DNA, you know, for sure. Yeah. Um... Like, and I'm sure this threw a whole lot of people off when they bought 1459 and the first song starts, New Direction. Well, well that's kind of why we put New Direction on there, because, you know, I mean, look, I, I've always said this about the narrative of Sugar Ray, and, you know, people make fun of the band, but that's because I make fun of the band. You know, I've given people free reign to make fun of this band because I've been making fun of this band since 1988. You know, that's kind of how I set it up. We stumbled upon some great songs and became a professional band, but you know, but I, you know, I, I have I have led the narrative on what people think of this band. So when people go, "Oh, Sugar Ray," well, I, I told you to think this way. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's kind of ironic how it all worked out. You know, you know, the fourteen. You know, Fly was obviously the anomaly on the record floor that sold two million copies and was gigantic. But there was no other song like Fly on that record. No, no. And you know, people were very quick to toss us off as one hit wonders. I mean, before the cycle of that record was even done. The public and critics especially were like, well, thanks for playing, Sugar Ray. You're going to be the biggest one in one of the 90s, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, on paper, they, they, that sort of philosophy could be backed up by facts, and I kind of felt the same way. Yeah. We stumbled upon the song Fly. It was like nothing else on, the, on that song, on, on the album floor. And so what I thought is, you know, when we came up with the, the next record, 1459, first of all, I'm going to give it a title that gives us an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. If the record's a success, it's the best title in the world. If the record's a failure, it's the best title in the world. <laughs> so I came up with the idea of 14 minutes, 59 seconds, of course, referring to Andy Warhol, everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame, mm -hmm. and implying we had one second left, meaning this record was our last second, you know? Yeah. Luckily, it happened, but I'm so I'm such an idiot. I want to make fun of myself and the band so much. I said, you guys, wouldn't it be funny to throw off everybody and think, you know, they were getting another record like Floor when they heard, you know, because back then you had listening posts at Tower Records or I'm not sure how old you are, Marcus, but 31. You know, OK, well, then you maybe might remember, but. They had, you know, they had CD stores and Tower Records and, mm -hmm. and Strawberries and all these CD chains. So you could go in there and listen to a new record on a listening post, meaning you could listen to it and before you bought it. Um, and so I thought, oh, my God, wouldn't it be funny, you guys, if we have this record 14 minutes and 59 seconds, and the first song you hear after hearing every morning on the radio is a death metal song, <laughs> and you're going, oh, my God, these guys did it again. I'm not going to buy the record. That's how we, I used to make fun of the band. I thought that was funny. Like, at my expense, I bet we lost some sales because of that. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's why we put that first, you know, song on there called New Direction, meaning we're going in a new direction. Like, I just, you know, look, I, I, I've spent too much time thinking about how to make fun of this band, and I've created this monster uh, 20 years later, you know. But at the core of it all, yeah, we've always been here to have a good time. That's been for sure. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an insecure person, and there's kind of, uh, manifested itself in the band, so I've always had this insecure self-awareness layer around myself as well, and that's you know that's just something that I've sort of fostered. And in that, we've kind of become the bullseye for things that maybe aren't the coolest in the '90s uh, in retrospect, but we were never cool anyway. And you know, still no one has more fun than I do. And but at the end of the day, we wrote four. You know, I, we wrote a lot of great songs in my opinion, but we wrote four that I'm very proud of, and obviously people. Uh, people love and, and still want to hear and they mean a lot to them as well so it's it's an honor 
Are there any songs that you hate that you've made or, or songs that you hate playing live? Half the songs that we re- released, recorded, I hate. <laughs> well, you know, when you're in a band collective and there's, you know, there's a bunch of songwriters, that's going to happen. Of course. Because you have to have a sort of democratic process to keep the band going. Yeah. You know, you're going to sacrifice your creative interests to let people get their say, to keep the, uh, the morale of the band up, to keep people feel like they're productive. I mean, there were three main songwriters in the band, Sugar Ray. Myself, our guitar player, Rodney, and our former drummer, Stan. Mm-hmm. And we kind of led the charge and, you know, melodically and stuff like that, but... You know, we wanted to include other uh, other two guys in the band at the time. We had a DJ as well. Um, another huge mistake from the nineties. <laughs> yeah. Look at that guy. We had a DJ in the band, man. What were we thinking? You had to. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. You had to. Yeah. Well, Deftones still have one, so I guess it's not you know it's not the most uncool thing in the world because they're 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 a really cool band. Um, I love Chino. I just saw him last week at the Smashing Pumpkins thing. Sorry to the name drop there, but uh, there you go, Marcus. Um, yeah, so um, you know, we really were a songwriting band by 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 democracy. Everybody had their say, uh, which was great and bad at the same time. So there there are songs that I can't stand, songs I've never listened to once we've recorded them and put them out, and that's what happens when you sort of write songs by committee. Uh, but you know, we wouldn't be here with the hits if we didn't all sort of have our say and write songs as well. So. Sure. Yeah, there's songs I can't stand, and there's songs we've never played live and will never play live because <laughs> I just they, they, they physically make me ill listening to them. Yeah. Was it, um, so was it the band's choice or the label's choice or kind of a combination of both where the, the, sound, the, the, the sound shifted between Ford and 1459? Well, I think, I think that the, the common uh, um, uh, misperception if that's a word um the, the the common idea is that you know there was something to do with the label or some sound to me we never you know floor was uh floor was heavier than lemonade and brownies yes yeah. you know <laughs> yeah, um, it was. but lemonade and brownies you know you can see a band that's playing with a bunch of different styles i mean we love the beastie boys we were you know we work with dj lethal from house of pain and the way he uh wrote songs he would just produce a track and give it to us and yeah. Yeah, we didn't know what to do with it, so we'd just start singing in falsettos or make up little, like, you know, little lilfy, uh, melodic parts. So, I, you know, it just kind of came from everywhere. So, I, you know, n- nothing ever, when we went in to go write a record, nothing was like, we got to do this style. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. Let's do this. I mean, except when Fly hit, we're like, you know what, these, these songs are kind of cool. Maybe we should write a couple more of these or at least try and do some in these vein. Which we did, but the label, we got signed in New York and we lived in L.A. And the label, I think, visited us in the studio maybe twice yeah. in the uh, 12-year career that we were on Atlantic Records. So <laughs> they had no say on it. And, you know, it, it was too impossible to sort of, like, have a aesthetic creatively for an album. When, like I said, you had five people writing. Mm-hmm. You had a DJ bringing in ideas, you know, hip-hop ideas. You had, you know, guys that love metal more than other guys and guys that love, you know, Sting. And so it was just... You know, there was just too many influences for us to ever to for one person to ever decide on an aesthetics. So everything kind of happened organically. There's kind of a misconception that when um, Fly came out or something, we changed the way the band sort of wrote songs. Well, no, that's not true. We always wrote sort of melodic pop songs uh, on every record. Some were harder, some were lighter, some were whatever the fuck they were. Sure. Um, but obviously, with Fly's success and having a little money coming in and being able to pay your debts off and, hey, look, maybe I can buy a car now, that was kind of fun. And playing in front of 12 people and then playing in front of 20,000 people was kind of cool. So we're like, you know what? We kind of like, let's fly. It's kind of a good template. Maybe people are digging that. So we naturally did a few more of those. But if you hear 1459, there's some new wave songs on there. There's some, uh, a couple crappy punk songs on there as well. So, I mean, it's all over the place. There's an old 50s style Everly Brothers song on there called Even Though. So, you know, it's, you, you couldn't, you know, we, we look, we enjoyed the success of fly like everybody else did, but we weren't ever trying to write something. And again, you couldn't do it with five different voices that were all trying to be creative. Sure. So here's a uh, here's a little question. The uh, the bulldog. Yes. Who, who, whose dog was it? That was our guitar player Rodney's dog Austin, and um, he became the band's unofficial mascot. You know, he was in <laughs> every video he had to make an appearance. I think the only video he didn't make an appearance in was was someday uh, during his uh, life. But, uh, yeah, Austin was awesome. I mean, Rodney got him when we moved to L.A. in 94, and um, 
his now wife, you know, she let the dog live with him half the time and lived in our house half the time. And, you know, we were six people living in a house in Los Angeles and going crazy. So we, we weren't responsible enough to take care of a dog full time. But Austin was the uh, unofficial band mascot. And, and Rodney, you know, I, I always said growing up, you know, the second we can, we're going to get a bulldog. I'm going to get one. You're going to get one. And then Rodney got one first. And, you know, he was just he was the band's mascot. He was just uh, a great dog. And um, he lives on infamy in the videos. And uh, he had a great life. I think he lived to be 12, which is kind of old for a bulldog. So, uh, yeah. Rest his soul, man. Good doggy right there, Austin. They're the best dogs. Yeah, they really are, man. They're just, uh, if people don't know, I mean, their only defense is how ugly they are. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I say that affectionately because they're just the nicest, sweetest dogs. And there is no nicer dog to have with kids. None. You know yeah. what I mean? They're so great. I agree. Uh, do you have one, Marcus? I do. Uh, I've had, uh, I grew up with one, and then I've had one now for the last three plus years. Uh, his name is name? Frankie, named after Frank Sinatra. Ah, oh, beautiful. Yeah. Love it. Love it, man. Love old blue eyes. So that's, that's, that's fantastic. That's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good duo right there. Bulldog and Frank Sinatra. Can't lose. It, it works, especially here in Vegas, you know I mean? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Uh, I'm going to switch just a little bit. Um, yeah, no problem. Lynn Street, Snot. Mm. Were you, were you good buddies with him? Really good friends with them. I have a uh, a tattoo on my forearm. I'm looking at right now. It says in memory of Lynn, 1968 to 1998. And you know, Snot and Sugar Ray had done played a lot of gigs together in Southern California. Again, throwing us back to that metal background that a lot of people aren't aware of. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. we really had our hooks to that whole world, and we're really good friends with the whole Corn guys, Deftones camp, and the Snot guys. You know, and I watched Snot get signed to Geffen. And then we went on a tour with them with another band called The Urge out of St. Louis that were kind of like a ska band with horns that had a hit with Nick Hexum from the band 311. And um, love that dude dearly, man, dearly. I, I remember the first time we played with them up in Santa Barbara, which is where they were from, um, you know, our aging set goes, uh, listen, man, there's this hot band in Santa, Santa Barbara. And, you know, I know it's a Sunday night, but, they're, you know, they're really big locally up there and they're going to draw some people. So I think you should do a show with them. We said, great, no problem. You know, and I love the name Snot. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> but I, I, I got to love these guys. I have to love them. So I went up there and uh, we, we see the club and Snot's on, we get to the club in the afternoon and Snot's on stage sound checking, you know? And I'm like, oh, fuck, these guys are good. And that front man's gnarly, man. You know, they reminded me of Pantera the second I heard them. Yeah. They just reminded me of like a punk rock Pantera, you know? Um, and I've got, God, these guys are good and you know they kind of saw us walk in it was a small club and we're sitting in the back looking at them and then they go in and play 10 seconds down a song by we had a record out then um that song that we did and proceeded to play it better than we could <laughs> sang it better than we could and, and i'd never heard the song played better before then or since then and i go oh my god not all these guys are assholes they have a sense of humor as well you know what yeah. i mean i go i think i'm gonna love these guys Long story short, we, uh, you know, we, we uh, just started a great friendship with that band, and, and Lynn became one of my, my close friends, you know, and, man, I'll never forget, we, I was um, driving on my way to play K-Rock's Weenie Roast out here in Los Angeles in 1998, which was, you know, K-Rock was a station in Southern California that had so much influence on me growing up, and sure. it was a gigantic station, and then when the alternative... Uh, sort of, you know, uh, explosion happened in the early 90s because of Nirvana, Jane's Addiction, Pearl Jam, etc. You know, alternative became the biggest selling genre of music in the 90s. So it was gigantic, and K-Rock was, was the cornerstone. It was, if K-Rock added your record, everybody else would fall in line like dominoes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to play K-Rock's Acoustic Christmas, I think it was. Um, and now... It was such a big deal to us because we're playing in a big venue. You know, we just come off the success of Fly. All our friends are coming up from Newport Beach. It's you know, our family's going to be there. You know, we finally made it to the big time. I think the Verb was on the the Bad Religion. I mean, just we're we're in there with the big boys. We've had some success, some success, and this is going to cap off a great year. And I get a call on the way to that gig. I'll never forget that Lynn had died in a car accident with his dog Dobbs, who was mm -hmm. was a French bulldog. Frenchy. Um, and I, I just, I hadn't cried in 20 years since then. Or, you know, it had been a long, long time since I got, but since I was a kid. Yeah. And then I started crying and welling up. And, you know, I, I, I just, it just ruined, it just broke my heart, man, because, 
you know, not only were they just great guys and great human beings, but that band was on its way. I mean, they, the next album would have been the one that broke them into superstar because Lynn was just such a charismatic superstar of a front man, and his voice was from, you know, I haven't heard another voice like his since Phil and Salmo that had that power and the, 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 the melody, and they could, they, could, they could be dynamic, and they were just such a great band. I mean, it's proof every other guy in that band and not has gone on to, you know, rock and roll success. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, they just they just had it all, and uh, unfortunately, man, uh, that car accident took it away. But you know, he, he lives forever in infamy, and Snot will ever will always live on. And what a, what, a, what a great debut they put on. But uh, yeah, no, I miss Lynn all the time, man. He's, you know, he, if you're lucky, you meet five people in your life that'll change your world, and Lynn was one of those for me. Awesome, as he should. Yeah, no yeah. doubt, man. He was a great guy, great guy. And I still see Mikey all the time, and Sonny. And uh, Shannon Larkin, the drummer's in Godsmack now. You know, uh, John John's in a band too. I can't remember, but anyway, they, they're just uh, just wonderful guys. When I see them, it's just like old times. What led you to doing TV stuff? You know, just opportunity. <laughs> you know, it wasn't something I really said. Hey, I'm going to be in a band and then get into the TV world. You know. Um, in the 90s, if you could sort of chew gum and read the monitors, they'd let you host things on the MTV Awards or yeah. the radio. You know, you know, it's just like either people didn't want to do it or they couldn't do it or whatever the reason. But I did a couple of them, and people were like, hey, it's kind of decent. And then MTV had a thing called Rock and Jock back in the 90s and uh, where they'd, they'd, they'd do music and, like, alternative sports, and I hosted that once. And MTV was like, wow, you're really great. Why don't you do some more of these? And so I slowly just started doing them. And uh, during the course of the band, when we were kind of in the cycle of recording and touring and, you know, being a band and a commercial band that was, you know, uh, you know, that was viable for the label, you know, I was only concerned with the band, writing and recording. And any time off, I just wanted time off because, you know, touring and that whole schedule is brutal. Of course. Um, yeah, but then in 2003, some other guys in my band said, listen, we've got young kids, we don't want to be, in, you know, we don't want to hit it this hard anymore, we kind of want to stop and smell the roses, and I didn't have kids, I wasn't married, and I didn't understand that at all, and I'm like, all right, whatever, <laughs> let me return a couple phone calls I've got here that people have been reaching out to me, and one of them was extra at the time, in 2000, 2004, and, you know, at that time, in 2004, you know, streaming was starting to happen, illegal downloading, and the labels, uh, the the recording industry is really starting to, you know, go into the tank a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the business model was changing. Mean, there was no business model. It was just like Robin Hood free for all. You you spend a million dollars on a record, we take it for free. You know, and uh, I, I think everybody was panicking. And and also organically, bands like myself, uh, Sugar Ray, Everclear, um, Smash Mouth, you know, these bands were falling out of favor in radio. I mean, radio is cyclical. It turns itself over every six, seven years, and we were right there in that seven-year period. And, uh, you know, I said, you know what, maybe it is a good time to sort of, you know, put the brakes on the band and see what else is out there. And I literally, literally took a meeting at Extra, just a meeting. I didn't know what it was, uh, but apparently it was an audition that I wouldn't have gone to if my manager had told me it was an audition. He just said it was a meeting. So I went in there just meeting people, and they go, all right, let's go on the stage. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and they're saying, I've got a mic in my hand, I'm reading, welcome to Hollywood, guys, the stars are out last night, you know, it's bullshit, and I'm like, oh my God, and I thought I sucked, and I go, I won't hear from them again, and then uh, two weeks later, I was hosting Extra in front of a national <laughs> audience, and going, how the hell did I get here, <laughs> and it took me a while to get decent at it, I mean, I remember once I was in a, uh, a 7-Eleven, six months into uh, starting at Extra, and I was getting coffee in the morning, and some dude walked in with like a neck tattoo and, and kind of like, you know, kind of just ominous and dark looking, kind of had a shady presence. It was 2004 when neck tattoos were kind of scary still. Um, he walks up to me, and I'm like, great, this guy's going to punch me in the face. He goes, dude, I've been watching you on Extra. You sucked when you started, but you're getting better. <laughs> <laughs> I said, thanks, bro. I appreciate that. That's the most backhanded, perfect comment I've ever heard. So yeah. I kind of had to learn in front of people how to be a host. And, you know, it, it was a great job, and I appreciate the people there. And I've got this set of tools in my back pocket, which is called hosting, if I ever need to bring it out or if I have the uh, the honor of uh, doing it every now and then. And then with that come, in, come into things like Celebrity Apprentice, uh, Celebrity Big Brother. And to be honest with you, it's a great way to just sort of remind people that I'm still in a band, I'm still alive, and they give you a nice paycheck. So uh, be it far for me to turn it down. Of course. Yeah, why not? Do you, uh... I mean, it's not like I'm protecting any credibility that we never had. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's funny when I hear people say that, or like, you know, it's like, we didn't have credibility when we were on the charts. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, mean, I, I purposely made sure that didn't happen. 
Do you do you have any interest in uh, writing, producing, directing, anything like that? Not really, dude. That takes a lot of talent and a lot yeah. of work. I don't think I'm built that way. You know you, what I mean? You, you just like being in front of the camera. Enough for me. What's that? You like being in front of the camera instead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do. I think it's more where my, my talent suit, if you will, if you, if you call that a talent. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah it, I mean, it's I have, its own skill, definitely. It is its own skill. I mean, a lot of people think they just go over and host things, and I think um, – you know, it, it's not that easy. There are certain things you have to do, and there's, you know, it's, 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 you're, you're, it, it's, it's something that can be learned, but you almost have to be born with it a little bit. You know, yeah. just that familiarity, and, and there's almost a, there's almost like a, uh, a, a invariable you need to have that makes people comfortable with you watching you. You know, and that's something that can be, it can be fostered a little bit, but it's something you have to be born with. You know, uh, so it's, it's. Um, it's it's a fun thing to do, but it, it does take a while to sort of get the machinations down on how to host something. So, you know, look, a lot of people try and jump into it, and they're terrible. And that you, you can see why. You know, it's just it's hey, everyone thinks they can do it, and it's not that easy. I mean, Ryan Seacrest makes it look effortless because he's that good and he's done the work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, but as far as writing though and stuff, dude, I have a hard enough time writing songs. So writing scripts or producing television shows, it's just I don't have that work ethic. My hat, my hat's definitely off to those who do. I mean, I became a lead singer for a reason, you yeah. know. <laughs> less gear to travel with, right? <laughs> oh yeah, way less gear to travel with, you know. I remember I used to piss everybody off in my band back in the old days when we had to like hump our own shit and set it up, uh, you know, like. We'd be sitting there after the gig, and there'd be chicks or something. You know, late eighties or something. I just run off some girls. They had to like unpack the drums, the amps, and shit. I mean, no wonder why everybody hates lead singers. <laughs> 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 they get all the attention. They don't have to bump down the, you know, you know, uh, break down the shit. All right. Do you have uh, Do you have any ridiculous, over the top, crazy rock and roll stories? I mean, dude, they're they're ridiculous over the top for the reason. You know what I mean? Because you don't know them. You know, there's just too many to even count, you know. I mean, there's just, you know, look, a lot of things I've done have been stupid and well-documented, you know. Um, and, you know, I attribute that to being young and stupid, you know. Um, but, I, you know, you learn, you know. I mean, uh, and the road also has a way of, of you know, you don't, you don't do the road. The road, the road does you. You know, yeah. when you're young and you're a new band, you're out there wide-eyed and like, I'm going to take it on the road. I'm going to party my balls off every night. It's going to be amazing. Well, that doesn't work like that. And you no. quickly find that out what your limitations are, or you don't find that out and you can't handle the road and you quit, or, you know, you find yourself in rehab or something like that. So yeah. the, road, the road shows you how to do it. You don't do the road. But everybody tries their own way at first. Everybody thinks they, you know, they're going to be the ones that does it differently. And uh, they quickly, well, or, or don't, not quickly, it takes a while to figure it out. So, uh, but yeah, there's so many crazy stories, dude. And, you know, look, I mean, there, I need to protect the innocent, and there's still, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there's still uh, statute limitations that haven't run out in some states before I can tell all of them. Sure. Uh, and I say that, and I say that jokingly, my friend, especially with today's climate. You know? In that regard, uh, would you ever do a book? You know what I mean? I, I, I don't know. It's funny you say that because I enjoy reading every, I've read every rock biography from, you know, uh, Stacy Blades, the replacement guitarist for Tracy Guns and LA Guns to, uh, you know, to, to Keith Richards life book. And I read them all and I love them. So I'm fascinated by them, but I never think of myself interesting enough to write a book, you know? Um, but I, I've, I've thought about it. I mean, are there stories enough to sort of have a, an arc? Are they interesting enough? I mean, I've definitely met enough people and, and done some exciting things, especially through my band Royal Machines as well. Uh, and it had a, you know, I've had an inside peek on what it's like to be backstage and what it's like to open for the Stones, what it's like to get a gold record. So I'm not going to say never, but there's no plans as of, as of now, you know. Okay. Um, but by the way, if you're going to write a book, those stories that I mentioned have to come out then. You know, because there's just too many good books out there. If you want to compete, you got to, you know what I mean? You, you got to really open up the chest. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the last Sugar Ray album came out in 2009, and then in 2015 you put out a solo EP. Were, were those kind of meant to be Sugar Ray, but I know there's kind of some issues... Yeah, yeah, I know. Two guys quit and then sued us, so that was a lot of fun. To get up. It's funny, we, you know, I used to watch Behind the Music in the late 90s. You know, <laughs> Those are great shows. Awful. What's that? Those are great shows. 
Oh, I they're amazing. The music. They're amazing. And I watched them all, and I watched with horror as they all went to the – and everybody went through the same process. You know, we got together. We got lucky. We got success. Coming up next, the band sues itself. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, that's not going to happen to us. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and we kept the original band together for 23 years, you know, and then uh, – Two guys decided to, to quit the band and ended up uh, getting in a legal situation because we couldn't agree how to move forward. You know, yeah. uh, fortunately now that's all settled and everybody's moved on and the other two guys don't even play music professionally anymore. So um, they're doing what they're doing. We're doing what we're doing. But um, um, what was your original question, dude? I'm sorry, Marcus. I got off the mic. That's okay. Um, the, the, the songs that were on the EP was that meant to be kind of oh, the yeah, sugary? Yeah. Exactly, exactly, because, we, yeah. you know, we, you know, at that time, uh, in 2009, we had a record out, and it's been a while, you know, since we'd put anything out, and, um, you know, when you're in a band, you do two things, you play live and you write music, you know, yep. and we certainly play live all the time, we never stopped playing, even when I was at Extra, we always played about 50, 60 shows a year, so we never stopped playing, and it was built into my contract that I could concentrate in the band and write music and put out records, and we put out our greatest hits during my tenure at Extra and toured a little bit on that. Um, but yeah, we, we, I had a couple songs in my back pocket and I said, you know what, why don't we just put these out and we'll just put them as a Mark McGrath to be for fun. And, and that's what we did. You know, we financed it ourselves, even though we went through pledge, but we only did that to get it out to people. But, you know, we, we put our own dough into it and we, um, we released this four song EP, which I'm, I'm very happy of and proud of. Um, we wrote, I think there's some great songs on there and we, we, we play some of those in the set as well. And, you know, you also write new stuff to like freshen up the set a little bit for yourself as well. Sure. Um, when you come see Sugar Ray, you're going to hear all the hits. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, you, you still play 75, 90 minutes or whatever you're playing. You got to fill in the rest of the set. So for us, it's fun to add new songs and they got to go through the process and the litmus test of whether they're good enough live and they can, you know, stand with the other songs. So that's what we kind of do in terms of writing. And when you do that, after a couple of years, you come up with a few songs. So we released the EP strictly for fun. Uh, again, it had no distribu- distribution. We just put it up on iTunes. But the good news is we've been working on a record, and uh, it looks like we're going to sign a deal. And I'm going to have another major label date, uh, deal oh, 25 yeah. years after having our first one. Uh, and uh, we'll probably put a record out in 2019. And, again, we're writing it at our own pace. We have completely realistic expectations. You know, uh, the, the, the labels have found a way now to make it work economically for them. Like, if you've had any hit at all, in, you know, and you have any presence as a band, they've figured out they'll throw a small advance to you. You can make your own record, however you do it, God bless you. And uh, they'll put it up, and they'll, they'll release it, and, you know, they'll eventually give their money back because they have such a small advance. But they have the, uh, you know, they have the distribution system to set it up and get it to the people that want to get it. Yeah. Uh, and international sales have increased for everybody, just like in the movie business, because of this sort of internet global village we live in now. So we've been fortunate enough. We stuck around just to, we we've stuck around just long enough to get another major label deal. So uh, that's exciting. We got about ten or eleven songs done, and uh, it's fun. It's what you know. When you're a band, you, you're, you're 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 creative people. That's what you do. And to have an outlet to put out another record, uh, it's really exciting for us. I'm definitely excited about it. Uh, oh, right on, man. Appreciate that, Mark. Super, super stoked. What do you think of the industry today and kind of how it's morphed in the last 10 years? Well, it's funny. It's like, you know, history has proved as more as things change, the more they stay the same. I, I read something online that um, in terms of streaming and profits, 12% of the entire profits of streaming go to the artist, okay? Yep. Now, when we were in the record deal business and we were putting out CDs, albums, or tapes, whatever you want to call it, that was about 14% went to the artist. Yeah. You know, and you think this whole, like, streaming world is going to open up a new thing for the artists and musicians, and it's going to be better, <laughs> and people will get the music quicker, and the artists will get paid properly, and here we are again. Yep. Not only are we getting the, basically the same rate, we're getting less. And I'm not complaining for me. I'm just It's just very ironic to me that... Nobody learned anything from these Chuck Berry, you know, uh, Little Richard deals we were all talking about, uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s when, when bands were single by. Yeah, you know what I mean? Here we are again and somehow are in the same position getting the same sort of uh, uh, compensation. And, look, as far as I'm concerned, we got lucky. We were a part of that last you know, salad days of the 90s when, 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 like, you know, the Internet was happening and people were flush with cash and they were buying CDs with one song on it for 20 bucks. <laughs> I mean, we, are, we were part of that. We got lucky. So yeah. 
I just think it's ironic to take a look at the whole situation now, and the history is repeating itself. And this whole thing that was supposed to make it better for the artists, better for the, the fans, it's just all stayed the same. And, and the labels, are they're, they're smart, crafty people. They've got great lawyers for a reason. They have the resources to pay them. And what they did was just got in bed with the streaming services. And did the, you know what, fuck these artists, man. We'll get in bed with you when you pay us for, you know. Because I'm sure, like, probably for the artists, probably for the labels, they're probably, like, 15% of their catalog really generates money for them. You know what I mean? Sure. So they probably have some deals with the, the, the streaming services. I need to be paid for these 50%. I don't care about the rest. You know what I mean? Yep. And there's some sort of payment. I, you know, look, I'm speculating, but it's just very ironic how we are in the same situation we were in 1958 when the artists are getting, you know, 12, 14 cents on the dollar. But again, I'm not complaining. I've been paid more than I deserved in, in this thing. I'm just worried about music going forward. I mean, I don't understand the social media game enough to really comment on it. On it. Yeah. But, you know, it seems to me there are kids and bands and artists that can get a couple million followers and be able to tour a little bit and get out there, which is great. But I haven't seen that sustain a career yet, and this is new. You know, having a social media following only and not having any backing of a label or a radio, it's all new. So let's see what happens in 10 years and where it goes. But uh, it's interesting. It's uh, the Wild Wild West. It's a new frontier, but it's still being regulated by the same people, ironically. You know, and that's what I think is missed by everybody. What's been catching your attention the last few years musically? Like, well, what have you been listening to? You know what I would love to say? I'm, I'm the latest and the greatest. You know, I've got eight-year-old twins, and they kind of keep me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really pop-leaning now. You know, I'll know the new Drake. Or I'll know the, you know, I'll know the In My Feelings because my kids are doing the shiggy in front of me. You know, like, what the hell is that? The shiggy, you know what I'm saying? So, I, uh, you know, when I listen to music, man, I'm too old to discover new stuff. I'll, I'll put on my Slayer. I'll put on Old Class. I'll put on Still Pulse. You know, um, it's funny, you know, when I buy music now, I, I'll buy it digitally. I'll forget I bought it, and I don't even know I bought it. And then I'll be on the treadmill like six months later. Oh, I forgot I had that record, you know. So <laughs> it's just I don't know how to receive music. I used to have a tangible thing. I had my hand, and I could see who engineered it and who produced it. And I could see the picture of the band. I could see the track listing. So I'm still trying to figure out how to discover new music. But uh, I've got eight-year-old kids, and the older they get, I'm sure they'll make me hipper than I deserve to be. Sure. Uh, speaking of Slayer, uh, farewell to her. What do you think about that? It's a shame. You know, when like, you know, benchmarks of your lives or like, you know, when, when people pass away, like when Sinatra passed away, you know, you, you were young, but I remember it, you know, it's like, man, a part of you dies when like something iconic like that happens, like Frank Sinatra passes away or, um, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, exactly. Prince, you know, David Bowie, George Michael. You know, there's been a lot lately, uh, unfortunately. 20, 2016 and, was pretty devastating. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. And, and, and you know, these are people that, like, you know, I mean, I, I love music like you do, so they were part of my life, part of my life's DNA. And, like, when they're gone, it, it hurts. You know, it's strange. And, and Slayer not touring, I mean, the one constant about every year was a new Slayer tour. You sure. know I mean? Well, I have the same business accounts as they do, and I'm always hearing about where they are, what they're doing, and how they're, you know, they're just, they're in Poland, they're in Hungary, they're just always been working. So Slayer not touring, I, I, I think this, I think they need a break. Those guys have been doing it for so long. I think they'll take a couple of year hiatus, you know, uh, recalibrate, refresh themselves, reinvigorate, and then get out there again. It's what they do. Yeah. You know, so Slayer, you know, it's like, I always say this when people go, are you still doing that band thing, Mark? I'm like... Well, do you tell a dentist when he's 50 or are you still doing that dentist thing? No, you, you know, never stop. You know? do. <laughs> That's what we got. Mick Jagger, God bless him. I'm not comparing myself or anybody to him, but he's still doing it because he can. Yeah. Michael Jordan would be playing basketball right now if he could. You know he would. <laughs> you know he yeah, would. Yeah, <laughs> and so would Kobe, you know, if they could. You know, so so it, it's it's uh, it, it's funny how people say that. So I think Slayer's just going to take a break, and once you sit there staring at yourself at the wall for two weeks, you're like, I'm in Slayer. This is what I do. Now, they might not yeah. go on tour for 10 months of the year like they, they always have. Normally do, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, they, I'm sure, we look, at where you, if anybody thinks they've think, seen the last of Slayer, you're insane. I mean, they're gonna, there's so many festivals now every year in, in uh, the States, so many great metal festivals. I'm sure they'll do all those still. They might even do a residency in Vegas. So, I mean, we have not heard the last of Slayer, I promise you that. I hope not. Well, we might have heard the last, you know, maybe the last record from them. Because when I hear Tom talk, he's just like, I, I just don't want to do it anymore. You yeah. Know? And, uh, 
And and you, you can see it in his face and hear it in his voice that he's just, he's over that aspect of it. I think you're completely right, Marcus, because they deliver, man. You know, that, that is punishing music to deliver. You know, it's not like they're going out there and singing Fly. You know yeah, what I mean? They're, and, they're, and they did it for, you know, 35 years. That as long music. As they don't, they've been doing it. You know what I mean? They've been doing it longer than you've been alive, bro. So, you know, they, they at the very least deserve a break. And maybe it's something they feel like they can't deliver anymore, you know, which is something I completely understand. What do you think for for yourself in regards to Sugar Ray? You know how how long do you think you'll keep going? Well, you know what these, these songs, fortunately, are. You know when when we worked with our producer David Kahn, he kind of he, he told me something that resonated with me to this day. Uh, I was going in to record Fly, which was the one song on that record floor that looked like it had a chance to do anything, and uh, I was really nervous about recording it, so we kind of saved it for the end. And I'm going in to record the song. And he goes, Mark, this is, he is David Conn, our producer, who produced what I got from Sublime and, and uh, was, you know, the reason, you know, he, that was the reason why we decided to work with him. We're like, wow, oh, this guy really knows what he's doing. Yeah. And he said, Mark, I got some good news and some bad news for you. And I'm, I'm out there about to record Fly, staring at the microphone. And I go, all right, dude, I'm an Irishman, so give me the bad news first, you know. He goes, the bad news is you can't sing. <laughs> I'm about to record Fly. I'm looking at the band in the in the uh, control room, and here's David with his glasses on, staring at me, telling me I can't sing. I go, uh, okay, bro, thank you for that. What could possibly be the good news? And he goes, if you listen to me, you have a tone in your voice, a small margin, but an amazing tone that I think we can sell two million records off this song alone. And I just got down on my knees. And I go, teach me. <laughs> Teach me, my master. You know what I mean? I just to let me know. And so he kind of told me that my voice works best in sort of a speaking, talking area. Yeah. You know, don't go out of the lane. Think about driving in a lane. Don't go in the fast lane. Stay out of the slow lane. You want to be right in that middle lane. That's where your voice wants it to be. Wants to be. That's where it's fullest, and that's where it's most organic and natural. So he kind of led me to water in that sense. And it's it's my sort of you know it's 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 you know obviously it's it's the tone is my talking voice, but with this melodic sort of. Uh, feel to it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's something that I can do hopefully for the rest of my life. I mean, I, I don't care if I'm playing in front of two people or 30,000 people. I love performing and I can't see myself stop to stop. There is no retirement plan for me. Yeah. You know, my, my retirement plan is dying on stage. You know, 75 at a Denny's in Barstow and having a heart attack after the third set. Hey, rock and roll. Three in one night. You know what I mean? <laughs> that to me would be a beautiful way to go out after I played fly five times in a row that night. Um, because <laughs> I just love it. It's, I love performing. I love doing this. I feel so fortunate to have ever had a career. Uh, there's been a lot of div divine intervention in getting me to the spot, and a lot of people have helped me get to the spot. So I'm very precious and, uh, and grateful towards it. And I'm not going to give my uniform back. You know, you're going to have to take it off me. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, that's the retirement plan. There isn't one, Marcus. So are, are you on, like, a actual tour right now or you're just kind of playing some shows here and there what's going on yeah we're doing a lot of fly-in dates i think i think i had one weekend off since may you know and that that's great you know uh there's a million casinos being opened up every day in this country thank god there's a million rib fest and a million shrimp fest that need the music of sugar ray uh every city has some sort of uh you know the taste of las vegas or the taste of chicago you know there's something always happening like that and fortunately, we're a band that gets a lot of these offers because I think of the mass appeal of the band, you know, and certainly the familiarity with the band. Um, maybe mass appeal is, 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 too, uh, is too ambitious of a term, but uh, I think the familiarity kind of... Uh, uh, I, think, I think Sugar Ray is uh, comfortable. Yeah, I just think we're not offensive. People know us, and I think it's a good combination. And we've been very fortunate to, to be able to fill up our weekends. And you know, I put a tour together called Under the Sun, that has a lot of 90s bands, and, you know, we've, we've done that a couple of years and gone out and, and done that and toured about five, six months of the summer, and I will definitely do that again, but it's a lot of work. You know, I put it together. I do all the publicity. I do all the, you know, dealing with the promoters and dealing with the local radio and stuff, and it's a lot of extra work, you know, and uh, Art from Everclear does a tour called Summerland every year, and he asked me uh, two years ago if I wanted to headline their tour, and so I'm like, wait a minute, you're going to pay me more than I get on my own tour, and I have to do none of the <laughs> bullshit about, yeah, no problem. So I kind of got used to that. And then last year I joined this thing called I Love the 90s, which is a 
a sort of hip hop R and B slanted tour, yeah. but it's the tracks, you know. And they asked me if I wanted to join it, and I was like, "Wow, I've never really played the tracks before." And you know, Sugar Ray's a band. If you see Sugar Ray playing, you're going to get a band. So I was a little bit concerned, and I told them, "Listen, I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be Sugar Ray's Mark McGrath or Mark McGrath or Sugar Ray, but I want to be Sugar Ray, and I want to play with the drummer at least." Yeah. And they were cool with that. So last summer I did I Love the '90s, and I did a. You know, 60 shows with, you know, and it was really fun. I played four songs and, and, and that was it. I had no overhead, no band, no crew. It was, it was pretty fun. Uh, so I, I've been able to do that as well now. Um, but, you know, Under the Sun is something that, that I, that I worked hard to create and it's, it's gained a little bit of traction. So I, it's like a car, like an old vintage car. I'll definitely take that out of the garage again soon. But basically I have eight year old kids now and they're twins and they're growing faster every day. And, you know, I, I think I've got, if I'm lucky, three or four more years where they want to hang with dad. Yeah. So I think doing the fly-ins every weekend has worked for me because I can be with my kids all week, you know. Um, and it's been fun to doing a lot of fun, you know, just fun, you know, father, you know, parent stuff. Like during the, during the week and being here during the week has been great. So we get enough work during the weekends where I can not have to tour during the summer. So to answer your question again, the most verbose way, about how I do, yeah, we're doing just a lot of fly dates this summer. But, again, I'm, I'm always open to touring at uh, – the opera's any presents itself, or if I want to put the work in it on the Sun Tour. Yeah. Well, look, I, and I'm sure plenty of other people, and even yourself, uh, super glad that you've been able to maintain all these years and still keep yourself in the public eye a bit, and, you know, you're still doing the band. You never really stopped doing that, uh, even though you fell under the radar to, to some some degree, you know, and a lot of people, if it's not in the mainstream, then they don't pay attention to it. But, uh, I'm one of those people that do pay attention. So, well, I appreciate uh, that Marcus, you know, it, you know, it, we've been very fortunate. I, as I said, I make my living playing music. So all is well in my world, you know, and, and the celebrity I have, you know, I, I'm very comfortable with, you know, people know who I am. There's no hysteria associated with it. I'll still get the great table, but I don't have to hire 95 security guards. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just, I kind of got a celebrity. It's like, Oh, there's that dude. Cool. What's up, man? You know what I mean? It's, it's a very sort of friendly and manageable kind of celebrity that I've, that I've been able to a achieve and a maintain. So, I, you know, I just it works in a lot of ways, and again, I, I've been given more than I deserve in this business, so I'm I'm happy to be here for sure. Have you played uh, at the venue you're playing at tomorrow? Have you been there before? You know, I we haven't played the beach party, but I think they did, and, and forgive me, but it was it's been about six, seven years ago. I think they did a thing in a tent. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <clears throat> someone else. Um, but uh, we've been to Waffle in the last couple of years, but I'm not sure if we, we didn't play the beach thing. That thing I know. And I imagine that's outside, correct? I think so. I haven't been there either, but I've I've heard about it. I'll probably uh, lose 10 pounds on stage, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Freaking 100. And, well, it's not just that it's in the hundreds, but it's been kind of humid lately. So. Yeah, that's just a double whammy of brutality. I saw, I saw it was 100 degrees at 9 o'clock at night. I mean, uh, even the sun goes down, it's brutal, you know? I, I think the one thing uh, you could probably be glad about is if it's a beach-themed kind of a place, and it's Sugar Ray, which is, you know, kind of california theme and all that, you know, I think maybe you could just go on stage in shorts and sandals in a tank, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> either, either way, we're going to sweat through whatever we have on anyway, so uh, we'll probably get to that, that, that stage anyway. But, you know, <laughs> hey, man, it's rock and roll, you know? There you go. <laughs> All right, man. Well, look, I appreciate the time, my brother. Yeah, I wasn't expecting a, an hour or so. Uh, it went by very quickly. I wasn't either, but I, I just looked at the clock. I'm like, wow, that was, that was a, I enjoyed talking to you. I appreciate it a lot. Um, surprisingly, as long as I've been a fan, I haven't seen Sugar Ray live yet, so tomorrow will be my first time. And I think it's good timing that I'm finally getting to see you. Uh, I'll be bringing a buddy of mine who goes by the name of Viking because he's six foot five with hair down to his ass and a big beard. So, <laughs> well, we won't we won't miss you, man, for sure, Marcus. I look forward to saying hi. See <laughs> you and Viking. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome, brother. Thanks again for the time. We'll see you tomorrow, my brother. All right, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Bye, Marcus. Take care, man.